بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All right, let's do this Ask me the most difficult questions about Islam that you can think of that a non-Muslim might ask me. The most difficult, or whatever you think to be difficult, okay? And don't ask me like mortgages and stuff, but the answer is haram. <laughs> the answer is no, that's not difficult. Okay? Uh, so the most difficult, yes sir? Uh, Aisha radiallahu was nine. Okay, Aisha's age, that's difficult, right? Yes sir? Yes. Uh, why doesn't a woman be there? Hmm. Very good. Someone else writing this down as well? I just need one brother to write this down. So that way we can have Ahmed, but Ahmed is doing that. Yes, sir. Sister, I'm coming to you. Yes, sir. Are you? Yes, the most difficult question. Well, actually, um, I forgot the name actually. I was going to ask later. Okay. Sister? What's the difference between Shia and Sunni? Okay. Very good. Sister? Yes? Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, yes, sir. How do you deal with a with a Christian that studies Sharia? I could. Oh, okay. But give me a specific question that Christian might ask you, so we can answer it. Yes, sir. Why are there so many sects in Islam, and which one is the true one? Okay. Which one is the true sect? So, yes, sir. Um, How about Ahmad? You write, okay? Just put the bullet point. We remember what it is. It was uh, like what came before God. What came before God? Um, someone came to me and asked me. Uh, they, they showed me a hadith in the Quran, mm -hmm. and they said that the Prophet did write. And did what? Did write. Uh huh. Right. And I didn't bring the hadith. Uh, okay. Um, and I didn't know what to say. Okay. Good. Yes, sir. Uh, if God is all powerful. He doesn't need anyone and he's merciful. Why does he need us to worship him? Why does he punish us if we don't worship him? Okay, what is it? You got that, Ahmed? Zakim Lachet, yes, sir. What does uh, Islam say about evolution? Evolution. Sisters, no questions at all? No you Sisters know all the answers. That's good. Yeah? Why is slaves still accepted? Slavery in Islam. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. What about the suffering of animals? The suffering of humans. Uh huh. Like a, a hunted animal by a tiger suffers okay. before it dies. Why? Okay, good. Why? Why do the animals suffer? Yes, sir. Well, why is there like always fighting? Is that a tough question? Okay, fine. Whatever is tough, that's fine. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. If God was merciful, why is there so much suffering going on? Uh huh. Suffering in honor? Yes, sir. It's a kind of something animal. Like, why do you have to, it's Muslims have to kill animals to eat them and stuff like that? Uh huh. No. Is that tough? They taste good, that's all. Pretty <laughs> <laughs> good. Yes, sir. Why would I want to be a Muslim? But is that a tough question? Because you don't want to be burnt in the hellfire forever, <laughs> that's why. Give me tough questions. Uh, how can you prove revelation that revelation came to Muhammad? Uh -huh. How can you prove revelation came to Muhammad? How can you prove that Allah exists? That's not really tough, but okay. Every religion promises paradise, so what makes us mom like? So essentially, how do you know this is the truth that will take you to paradise, right? Great. Yes, sir. How do you know uh, who's the real God? Okay. Yes, sir. How can you prove uh, Sahih Hadith that Muhammad is the real God? Non Muslims ask you things like that? Non Muslims. Non Muslims who only believe in the Quran, uh -huh. believe in the Sunnah. Okay, but. So I put that as a different page of like Muslim question, but uh, yes, sir. Yeah. How can you prove that uh, Rasulullah was actually a messenger? Uh huh. Good. Uh, yes, thank you. Finally, sister that doesn't know something, go ahead. How can you believe they can't? What? How can you believe what you can't do? Or how can you? We already said that, Ahmad. How do you prove the existence of Allah? Right? Uh, tough, tough, tough question. Yes, sister. How do you know that the Quran hasn't been changed? Changed. Good. Yes, sister. Um, what about jihad? What about, what about jihad? Just write the J word there. <laughs> <laughs> Why is Allah just uh, right there? Yes, your brother said that. Very good. Yes. Tough one. Why, why do we, why not worship Allah? What? Why not? Why not, not worship Allah? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir? But we said the kind of Allah is lending us to worship, and we're answering that together. Yeah? Uh, how, how could religion say that um, say that killing people will actually bring you closer to Allah? 
I'm going to show you. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I've read about Islam and Muslims tell me about it, but I never see the, the goodness in it. I only see Muslims doing bad things. So why would I join a religion that people don't do what they say? But is that tough? Yeah. yeah. It would be, is it? Okay. Well, whatever you say. Yes, sir? Uh, why can't I worship God my own way? Why is it uh -huh. because of religion? Okay. Actually, don't put that one down, Ahmed, because it, that's coming up. Well, I want stuff out from you. Yes, sister. Um, equality, obviously, like women are so fast. Possibly, yeah. Equality question. That's good. Yes, sir? Um, what do you want to do with the ruling on cutting a hand from the steel okay. or stoning the bathroom? There you go. The, the one who apostatizes stoning. It's a good stuff. Yes? <laughs> Okay, good. So they dress for themselves. Some I do better than you. I dress for a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, why are all Muslims doing good deeds and their parents? Why are all Muslims uh -huh. doing good deeds and their parents? Uh huh. Okay, good. For about seven, 60, 70, 80, whatever years of good or bad, I'm going to get an eternity of, of mm. paradise or hell. Okay, and you know the answer to that? Okay, but you heard that question? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So if someone disobeys Allah for 50 years, why well, doesn't Allah tor torture them for 50 years? They disobeyed Allah for 50 years only. Why did they get eternity in the hellfire? Everyone see the question? Ooh, one more time. If someone disobeyed Allah, he did 50 years of sins, he should get 50 years of hellfire. I mean, in the worst case, 100 years of hellfire. Why does he get eternity in the hellfire? Brilliant question. You should get some kind of a prize, sir. Good question. And, yes, sir? Where did this come in Arabic? Where did it come in Arabic? Okay, fine. Yes, sir? Suicide bombings. Suicide bombings? <laughs> or martyr bombings. Martyrship, martyrdom operations. <laughs> okay. So we're doing this in jail over here. All right. You want me to stay in Calgary permanently? Yeah. <laughs> Play. Um anything else? Anything tough? Yes, sister? A lot of what questions? About Qadr. okay, good. Well, Qadr, don't write it, Ahmed. It's in the notes. It's coming up. Okay, uh, yes, sir? Ahmed? Uh, I get this question now. What's going to happen to Mother Teresa? She's going to have the Mother Teresa, huh? Okay. No, well, you have two options. You can be right beside her and see what happens to her, or you can look at her from up top. <laughs> okay, so. All right, great. Right. Now, and you want me to answer all these questions, right? Oh, great. Yeah, I learned this from Jan Abdurrahim Green, actually. You know? That you ask all the tough questions, and guess who has to answer them later? You do. So you're going to answer these questions. Now, you're going to answer these questions after you know a lot of techniques, so it won't be that difficult, trust me, shut me up. And if you want me to prove it to you, I can ask you some of them right now, and we'll see how long it takes us to answer them, and then we're going to go through some of the techniques, and you'll see that it takes you a lot, it's a lot easier to answer after you know some of the techniques. But okay, let's move forward now. So these were all the excuses why, or, or things that would stop someone from becoming a Muslim, or stop you from being an effective day and bringing people to Islam. And they're not just limited to those five on the board, there are probably a lot more. Um, okay, let's do this. Um, you know, it's like, okay, going over the, you know, sit down da'wah, street da'wah. If you read it, it's quite self-explanatory. I'm mostly involved, I'm, I'm concerned, we're trying to get us to vote, to talk about things that we, we need, skills that we need for the next you know, week or two or maybe the rest of our lives. So I don't want to necessarily talk about, you know, sit down. I mean, obviously, you, we, we said that already. I want to show you when I skip a page, it's not a big deal. This is the page I skipped, and this is why I skipped it. We already discussed point number one. We did. Point number two, self-explanatory. That's why I skipped it. Point number three, self-explanatory. So that's why when I skip a page, you can trust that, inshallah, it's not a big deal. But if you insist, you put your hand up and say, why did you skip that point? For example, there's, there's one here, it says if they repeat an argument, rephrase it and say it back to them. So this is one of the techniques, when someone asks you a question, they keep 
uh, you know, someone is discussing religion with you. You explain something to them, they say the same thing over and over and over again. Well, that's because, you know, he died for our sins, and that's why this, this, and that. So you explain, you talk, well, but Jesus died for our sins, and that's why. You explain again, but he died. What they're really telling you is, I don't think you heard me. So they're going to keep repeating it. Anytime, not just in da'wah, in anything in life, your child, your friend, keeps repeating the same thing over and over to you, they keep repeating it to you because they don't think you heard them. So the way to get them to stop repeating it is to, right there, rephrase it and say it back to them. So let me see if I'm understanding you correctly. You're saying that because he died for our sins, this, 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 and that. So now they feel, oh, they heard me, now they feel comfortable, now they stop repeating the argument. So that's what that was about. Um, you know, that was with the internet, that's what I'm just showing you, the page that I skipped through. So it's saying, you know, stick to the point, meaning, you know, just throwing random pieces of information and just copying and pasting from other sides of it and then plugging it into the, the chat or whatever, the email. Uh, you know, the rules are the same, rules of da'wah, you start with tawheed, you, you build on the five pillars, things like that. You know, you give them further, or, you know, links for further reading. As a general rule, men try to communicate with men, and women try to communicate with women. Because you don't want to give the shaitan an avenue. And so many times, they'll get emails or calls, and someone will say, I started giving this guy da'wah, and now I'm emotionally, a woman will say that, now I'm emotionally attached to him. You know, or we have all those, you know, da'wah brothers, you know, they do all these things He's a bihillah, you know? <laughs> I love those guys. You know, everything is for the sake of Allah. One time in Toronto, this guy told me, he says, you know, I like these sisters, but I like them for the sake of Allah. I said, aren't you sweet? <laughs> <laughs> for the sake of Allah. <laughs> uh, you know, let me just run through the, page, the, the ones that I was talking about. You know, so this is just, the, it tells you the six slides I'm about to talk about. You know, when you're passing out pamphlets, it's an area with heavy traffic. And this is what we were talking about yesterday, Ahmed. You know, you want to hand out as much material as possible. You spread out your people, you canvas that area. So you've got, you know, four entrances. Let's say this is an entrance, that one, and those two. And there's a lot of traffic people that are going to be coming in and out of this room. So I'm going to have a brother there, a brother there, a brother there, and a sister there. They're going to pass out material. I'm not just going to have people in the front of this one door, and then I'm missing those three doors. I have a plan. Uh, don't talk to each other too much. You always see this one, because people, they're too embarrassed, okay? You know, tons of people are coming through that door, and I don't want to stand in front of the door and say, Hey, information about Islam, sir, here you go, some reading material for you, here you go, there you go, there you go. It's embarrassed. So I want, you know, to look like I'm busy doing something else. So I grab Brother, Brother Ziyad over here, and I start telling him, You know, what? we need to do that one, man. We need to work for this deen, so this deen can become, have the upper hand on this earth. And we can inherit the earth as the Allah promised to believe it. Okay, we'll do some work for the deen, you know. <laughs> you, you, so don't talk to each other. A lot of times people just keep talking about, about the importance of da'wah to one another as people are walking by. So, your plan here, remember, your goal was to hand out as much material as possible. Sometimes that's your plan. Sometimes your plan is, no, I just want to talk to as many people as possible. You know, your pamphlet is just there to start the conversation. You pass it, you look them in the eye, you ask a question, they stop, you start talking. Sometimes you just want to pass out material. Like, you know, especially rallies and stuff like that, people are already chanting things, there's not much time to talk, you just hand out material as much as possible. Don't do the thing where two brothers keep talking to each other. You know, about working for a lot. Work. Do the work. So, um, you know, don't miss a single person. Remember the guy gave him a pamphlet and he said, what do I do now? There could be another guy like that. But you missed him because you were telling him to talk to your brother over here. Don't talk, just pass around, pass material. Have a catchphrase. Now, the whole idea is you want people to stop and talk to you. Really. I mean, if you just want to pass out a pamphlet, just throw them in the air. But you want to talk to people at some point. So, the, one of the ways to get people to stop, you have a catchphrase. Someone give me a catchphrase. Someone new. Meaning someone who has not heard the workshop, somebody new. Catchphrase. What would you say if you want to give someone something to read about Islam? What would you say? There's no wrong answer. Yes, sister. What do you know about Islam? Here you go. What do you know about Islam? Learn and prosper. What? Learn and prosper. Learn and prosper. I like that. I like that. Who likes that? I like that. I've never heard that one before. Learn and prosper. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good. Yes, sir. What's your purpose in life? What, oh, what's the purpose of life? It's not a bad one. Very good. Yeah? For your salvation. For your... Oh, brothers, well, a hardcore over here. <laughs> for your salvation. There you go. For your salvation. Yes, sir. Do you know your Lord or learn about your Lord? 
Very good. Learn about your Lord. Do you know your Lord? Protect yourself. Protect. Oh, man, I like this guy. Do you sell insurance, sir? <laughs> he said, protect yourself. Very nice. <laughs> I like that. These are great. I should steal some of these. I've never heard that one before. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. Very good. Protect yourself. You know? So when you protect yourself, oh, hi. <laughs> no. So, great. Excellent, excellent. Good job, you guys. Excellent. Anyone want to add anything? Yes, sister. What's that? Okay, nice, nice. Correct. And, and possibly when you say that, your pamphlet has something to do with that, right? Great. Yes, sir? So you already know the answer? You or, sorry? You already know the answer? You, you might say that as you're handing it out? Yeah, like, no, because, like, let's say it says, like, you know, who is Allah? And you'd be like, oh, no, thank you. Like, we already know the answer? Uh-huh. Okay, good, good. Excellent. One more? Yes, sir? Explore Islam. Explore Islam and? The truth is near. The truth is? Near. Near? Okay. <laughs> truth is near. The truth is here. <laughs> okay, good. Play. So now, uh, and, and the one I like to use, and just happens to be the one, but I might start using protect yourself now. <laughs> is that you know, you know, free information on the purpose of life. That's just what we say. Just nice and easy. Free information on the purpose of life. Free and beneficial. They take it. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Free information on the purpose of life. They refuse it. Thank you. Have a good day. If they take it, you know. And then sometimes they look you in the eye. Free information on the purpose of life. What is the purpose of life, sir? And then they might tell you something. And whatever, right or wrong, it doesn't matter. The whole point is they stop and you might say, well, this is what Islam says is the purpose of life. And you start talking. Free information on the purpose of life. Free and beneficial. And my thing is, you either take it or you hear it. So if they don't want to take the pamphlet from me, I want to still make sure they hear the message. So free information on the purpose of life. They don't take it. And what is the purpose of life, sir? To worship the Creator is the purpose of life. Thank you very much. Free information on the purpose of just like that. You know, you're walking around, you're talking to people. This morning, you, you, you're, you're greeting them. I always tell people, you already look like Osama, so smile when you meet people. You know, it's a nice experience. You smile, you have you know, good morning and good day, and thank you very much. They take it, you thank them. They don't take it, you thank them. It's not a problem. And that makes that whole shy thing and embarrassment thing go away. They say no. Just thank them very much, and that's it. And and it has happened in the past when when, when you refuse, like one time someone refused to take a pamphlet, I still thanked them, and they came back and they liked the fact that you know you were polite to them. I said, you know what, thank, you. I'll take it. Come, it doesn't matter. It's fine. So, um, so I, I think I won't skip any pages. I'll just go over them quickly. So we didn't skip any pages. Now here in the end, know what you're handing out. Know what you're handing out. I want you to think of a, a, a number of things here. First of all, not every pamphlet is good. That's the truth. There's some pamphlets that are not good. They're not well written. That's true. And some of them, and the majority maybe, are, and we're just now starting to see some new stuff come out. But for the last 15 years, we've been handing out stuff printed in the 70s. With that horrible ink, and the different and weird language, and not relevant, and just so on and so forth. So not every pamphlet is good, and not every good pamphlet, we've established that it's good, not every good pamphlet is appropriate, right? Who practices polygyny? Is that a good pamphlet? Yeah, it's a good pamphlet, but is it appropriate for every situation? I'm walking on the street just handing out that pamphlet, yeah, here you go. The man's polygyny, ashhadu <laughs> Probably not. But, but what if I have an event about women in Islam? So I have, you know, that pamphlet, Who Wears the Veil, Women in Islam, Polygyny. Is it appropriate now? Yeah. Makes sense now. So not every pamphlet is good, and not every good pamphlet is appropriate. So it's good to have a rough idea of what you're handing out. I'd like to suggest a pamphlet that roughly covers Tawheed, the Prophet and, and the other four pillars. And something about maybe life and death in the end. If that, and there are many like that, by the way. Most of them tend to have those important points in there. And uh, so, no, have a rough idea. Just skim through it. Know what it, what you're handing out. Because a lot of times, people they just you know they come into the box of pamphlets that they're going to hand out, and so they say, oh well, let me have some of the green. The blue is nice. Some of the red. Oh, any more of the pink? Now we have problems now. So it's not about the colors. You know what you're handing out. Because the joke is. You give it to a non-Muslim and they say, what is this about? And your answer is? About Islam, right? Of course it is, right? All right. So, know what you're handing out. 
Uh, anyone want to ask anything about this page? Yes, sir. Um, I noticed that in Canada, people are a little bit different. I wouldn't say that they're they're nicer or meaner than in the States, mm -hmm. but like even at Walmart, you know, in the United States, they have greeters. Mm -hmm. And the greeters are very aggressive in, in the United States because Americans are like that. Whatever they, they think, they, they say it out loud. Mm -hmm. In Canada, the greeters are asked not to talk to people, actually. Really? They're asked, like, when people come, be there, be seen, and people will come to them and ask them for directions. But as Canadians, are not really like that. Uh -huh. And I've noticed that, because I when I visited Dallas, people would pour out their life story to you, and you don't even know them. The greeters or just people? People on the street. Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's strange. So, uh, like, people say Canadians are nicer. They're not nicer, but they just, uh, like, if you hand out a bunch of pamphlets, mm -hmm. they kind of... They, they think, you know, Jehovah's Witness, they think people like that. Uh -huh. So it's, I think, I, I don't know if I'm correct, but I think Kennedy's a little higher. Okay, good. So, well, thank you for saying that, you know, because, I mean, obviously I don't live in Canada. Like, I had this incident you know, three years ago, I went to give the workshop in the UK. And a lot of the things that applied to the US just were totally useless in the UK. You know, the whole section on Trinity was useless in the UK. Most people don't believe in Trinity. Most people are atheists. And the problem to run into there are the atheists, not, not those who believe in Trinity. So, uh, so you're going to have to now adjust to what suits you know, your locality or your, or your country. So uh, as I go, and Zakhla Khair for pointing that out, you can always tell me, look, you know, be quiet, because this doesn't apply here. And I'll just skip that section. All right? So good. Now, now, I want us to think about this so tomorrow we can start to, or maybe towards the end of the day, we can start to formulate ways of responding or, or tweaking things so it works for Canada. Maybe what I just, the demo I just gave you of telling people, you know, free information on the purpose of life, maybe it doesn't work here in Canada. So we might do it another way. You tell me what that is. I can't tell you what that is. Maybe we're just going to hand out pamphlets, but without saying a word. I don't know. Maybe that makes a difference. Or maybe you just might ask a simple question. Or you might just say, you know, pray thee, take this. Or I don't know what you do, but <laughs> someone tell me something by the end of the day. Okay? Okay? Thank you, sir. But uh, anything else? I want to add the good point. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, sir. So, are there any uh, pamphlets that like you've had an experience of with, or that you've um, Like I said, any pamphlet that mentions those basic things, trifold. That's what you pass out more than anything else. If the more expensive you give to the serious person, the bigger the book or the pamphlet you give it out when you feel that person might read or will read, or they ask for it specifically. Someone says, "I want a Quran," I give them a Quran. The brief illustrated guide to Islam, it used to cost a lot back then. And you just don't throw it out like a, a trifold pamphlet. But sometimes you meet someone who you feel this person will read. You give it to them. Or they actually <coughs> see that book and they're more interested in it than a small pamphlet. You give it to them. So, um, but uh, you know, one of the ones that I like also, that one called Just One Message. You seen that one? No? Okay, well I really like that one. Uh, if you write it down, I, you will have a rough time getting hold of it. And I've always promoted it, and people can't find it. <laughs> and even, I gave them the email address and the phone numbers and everything from the pamphlet, and none of them work whatsoever. But, write your own. Write your own. Okay? Now, the just one message, what, what, I, what I like about it, it's brief, to the point, it gets people to think outside of the box, and I've never ever seen this except in that one pamphlet. It asks for the shahada in the end. Excellent. You know, the credit card application says, fill this form out now. It asks for your business. Everyone pamphlet just talks about Islam, this, 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 and if you don't burn it, do it, this will happen, and then have a nice day. This one says you need to become Muslim right now. Look for, you know, a masjid, and look and, con and contact them and become Muslim. So you can write your own. Yes, sir. Would you recommend uh, also handing out <coughs> like a follow-up card if you're interested? Uh, or you have more questions, or you want someone to talk to you, contact this email? Sure. Or you could have just that sticker, and you've stuck it on all your pamphlets that you're going to hand out. They have the email address of the MSA or the message that you're associated with, whatever it is. So it works, definitely. Uh, anyone else? Yes, sir. I just another question. When you talk to people, um, like, what do you use to describe Allah? Like, do you use Lord God or Allah? Okay, we're coming to that. It's in one of the slides. <laughs> Right. Um, so here again, quite clear, you know, stay with the topic, the rules are the same. The rule, are, uh, you talk about the same thing if it's one person or 50,000 people. It's not that, you know, here the, the talk changes. 
don't misrepresent Islam. A lot of times people, they try to tell the audience something about Islam that's really not true to make them feel more inclined to become a Muslim. I'll tell you why that backfire is coming up, inshallah. Uh, street da'wah, you know, or, or MSA da'wah table type da'wah. Just for those who, I will be using a lot of street da'wah examples for the sake of the example and dialogue that went about. But I, I'm not a big fan of street da'wah anymore. Okay? That doesn't mean it doesn't work, but I'm just not a big, big fan of it. I just want to put that out there. Because most of the time, I'll tell you, we were in D.C., we were doing street da'wah, and this happened, and that happened. But I'm not a big fan of that anymore. Um, you know, when you do it, even within university settings, I recommend that you be in groups, or I mean pairs. You know, no, I, we travel as a group up this big main road, or we stay as a group in North Courtyard, but then we break up into pairs, so if we can, ideally. It's just, there's so much benefit of the partner, we're coming to that. Um, you know, it takes security into consideration. Uh, you know, sometimes you might buy a little bit more time with someone when you walk with them a little bit. It's one technique we learn from one of our young God. But the point is, that's more related to street da'wah. A lot of it does apply to your university table, table type da'wah. We already went through this slide. Uh, the next one, in a, and I think we went through that as well, and we, we were saying that, you know, don't give the shaitan an avenue. So we don't want to always, you know, this guy's taking out you know, the prettiest girls out to, to dinner to talk to them about Allah. So that's not how it works. <laughs> so we don't do stuff like that. And once the talk goes beyond or outside of what, what it is in Islam, then we have a problem. So even if the sister is telling this person about Allah and the Prophet, there's no one else except her, fine. But the minute it gets into, hey, giggle, giggle, I like the color of your, your hijab or your shoe, then we have a problem. You know? So. One way we solve that, uh, or we used to, is that this is our da'wah table. We have two brothers over here and two sisters over there. And guess who comes to get information from brothers? Yes, Jennifer and Edwina and Vanessa and those people. <laughs> and get who comes to those sisters to learn about Islam? Chad, Brad, and the other guy. So what happens? We do the quick trade. You know? And so she comes, she wants to learn about Islam. Okay, well, let me introduce you to Mr. Yes, Fatim over here. This is Vanessa. She would like to know something about Islam. You come back here, they bring you Chad or whoever comes, and you just keep it like that. Don't give shaitan an avenue. But if there's nobody there, khalas, you, you lower your gaze, you talk. You don't just... Alright. Okay. What's... Uh... Before I move on, I'm going to talk about something. When we were talking about pamphlets, and I was saying not every pamphlet is good. You know, there is this thing where when it comes to da'wah, we don't study. And we don't engage in study. Even those of us who are scientists in, 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 you know, in life, when it comes to da'wah, the science flies out the window for some reason. A lot of times, this is how a, a, a good pamphlet is written. Some guy opens up Microsoft Word, he starts to type what feels good to him. He prints it. Next day he shows it to his friends. They read it. This is great. They're all Muslims now. All of them like it. This is excellent. And then they say, let's print 100,000 copies of it. Great. Play. This is how I would like to see some group uh, put the pamphlet out. And there's actually a group in Australia that uh, they're doing a great job. They have put a lot of study into formulating an effective pamphlet. When actually, when I spoke about this at the workshop, they were in there and they came to me in the break and said, we've been actually doing this, we're working on, you know, pamphlet. They wrote it, then they're going to get, you know, different focus groups and, and people to read it of different ethnicities, different religious backgrounds, different age groups, male, female. And then they're going to take this survey. What part did you understand? What part did you like the most? Which part was confusing? Then they're going to adjust and make the all necessary changes, then they will make the 100,000 copies. Make sense? Makes sense, right? So, not just, you know, what feels good to me or what sounds good to me, you know? Uh, so, uh, like, there's, there's one guy that I know, he owns a, an, an audio company. He'll only sell audios of the recital that he likes. That's you. You don't like this recital. But there's 100,000 other people that like this recital. You're only going to sell them what you like? So, you know, it's, everyone has different tastes. So the same thing, you know, I like this pamphlet, and Ziyad liked it, and Ahmed liked it, and Ahmed liked it, and Ahmed liked it. So, khalas. <laughs> Let's put it out. 
No. Let's get other people to see what non-Muslims, how do they feel about it? So that's what I'm saying. When it comes to that, sometimes we forget about studies. There's a sister, got a PhD in something related to statistics. All right? Look at the field, statistics. And there was a non-Muslim who read a copy of the Quran. He was offended by one statement in it, okay, in, the, in the translation or the explanation. And she started going around campus telling people, don't ever give this copy out to non-Muslims. It offends them. It was just one person who was offended. But she kept walking around saying it offends them. Now, that copy has actually been in circulation for about 15 years. It's one of the most popular. Many people came to Islam because of it. And very few, if any, people have complained. Now, this one guy now, after 15 years of circulation, has complained. She's saying, let's, let's take it off the shelves because of one person. And she studies statistics. What happened to science suddenly? With Dawah, you want to go on Baraka. You know, we don't want to go on study science, research, we want to roll on barakah. And lately we've been running on fumes of barakah. <laughs> so let's do some study. Okay, one more scenario. Um, I don't know if we did this in uh, Power of One. Did we do it? No? Okay, that exercises, no? So basically, uh, there's one person who called me up and he said, look, from now on I'm going to, I'm not doing any da'wah like this, but I'm going to be organizing Islamic nasheed concerts. And that will be my da'wah to non-Muslims. So what's your argument here? Or maybe you agree. What's your argument? Someone tells you, from now on, my da'wah is organizing Islamic Nasheed conference. I'll bring, you know, uh, you know native bika, and, he'll, and they'll sing, and whatever, and all that, and then people will become Muslim. Yes, sir? Um, what, uh, what I'm saying is that have you, have you verified that uh, all the Nasheed artists are, what they're saying is correct and their methods are halal? <laughs> okay, fine, all right. But that's assuming that if their methods are correct and their voices are halal and their words are halal, then that would probably be a good da'wah thing. That's assuming that. How do you plan to separate between brothers and sisters? He says, okay, I'm going to have barbed wire and electric fence. Doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> yeah? Music. Now? Music. Okay, but, but you're all assuming that if there's no music, this will work. Yes, sir? Is your target market listening to Najib? You must be, uh, what are you, man? MashaAllah, target market and stuff. I like it. We need to talk during lunch. Good. Yes, sir? Yes? Oh, uh, I was going to say the same thing, actually. Oh, I need to talk to you, too. <laughs> yes. What makes you think that that is an effective way of giving doubt? Okay, we need to establish that first. What makes you think this is an effective way of giving doubt? And that was... I mean, you said it in a very nice way. I actually just said, you know, I don't think he will become Muslim because of an Islamic Nasheed concert. He said, uh, and I'll get to you. Because now we got to the point that, I mean, you're probably right, but I'm telling you this is what happened in the story. That's what I said to him, and this was his answer. Now I need you to answer this part. He said, no. One time, I was at an Islamic Nasheed concert, and when the concert was over, a guy got up on stage and took a shahad. So it does work. It does bring people to Islam. Now, re respond to that. Let me try sisters first. Yes, sister in the back. Um, basically, they were looking, uh, they're taking out of context. Mm -hmm. The whole purpose of it that you want to do is to have it for a da'wah, mm -hmm. whereas da'wah is just like a machine concert. So they're focusing, the, they're thinking it the wrong way. You, I mean, you were right, but he's going to come back and argue with you again. Look. The guy took his shahada after the concert. So I'm going to prepare concerts from now on, invite different speakers, and that's it. Sister? How do you know that he took the shahada because of the concert? Huh. Excellent. Sister is a scientist. Not that you were wrong. Everybody was, you know, but the question was, how do you know that he became a Muslim because of the lyrics in the song? How do you know that? That is what they refer to as one data point. You just see one data point. You don't know what happened before it. First of all, let's go all the way back. First of all, do non Okay, go ahead, sister. No, I was just going to say, it's just one person. And then to your earlier previous point, you don't know the success of it. Okay. Zakul khair. But I'm um, excellent. But like now, let's go back to the, what the sister was saying. So how do I know what happened to this guy to get him up on stage? First of all, let's go backwards. Do non-Muslims usually flock to concerts if, if they say, you know, a native bika is coming to town. Right? Does anybody know who that is? So do they just come and flock to these concerts? 
So what, what will you think? Why is that non-Muslim there then? What might have happened? Take a guess. Yeah? Maybe, maybe he, was, he was already Muslim, that was just his public shahada? Possibly. That's also very true. And sometimes there are some of those fake shahadas. I know, because I've seen some of those. The guy took shahada last week, but we have an event today, so come and do it on stage. And all the sisters are crying and stuff, but he was already been Muslim, you know? <laughs> and we're all like... <laughs> yeah? His friend brought him. His Muslim friend. There you go. Most likely he was invited by somebody. It's not like Michael Jackson came, came to town. <laughs> I the children. I mean, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I can't resist the light. But if that guy really did become Muslim, I already told people I'm going to book a, a flight to. And I apologize to him. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, um, what happens when. Well, non-Muslims don't typically run to these concerts. They don't know these groups, so most likely we can assume his friends probably invited him to that concert. Come with us. Now, do we know what he went through before coming up on stage? Maybe he sat with them, read half of the Quran. Maybe they took him to Islamic events, fundraising dinners. They took him to the masjid. They took him to you know, the basketball game in the masjid. They, maybe he went through so much before coming up on stage and finally saying the shahada. So as the sister said, you just saw one data point. You don't have enough information to assume that he became Muslim because of the lyrics. And plus it's a huge, huge concert. A lot of posters, a lot of you know, advertising, a lot of money to get one shahada every time. You could put you know, that same effort and money into something and get you a lot more people to become Muslim. But to everyone, is, you see what's, what's wrong here? Yeah? Yes, sister. Very true. The, the, the direct relation that to have an event and so everyone become Muslims wouldn't work. But maybe it will affect some of them to read more or to know more. Exactly. I like what the sister is saying because she is not, you know, um, what's the word? Like crossing out. Like, yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, and she's not, you know, putting aside the possibility that it could be something that works. Or it could be something that it's, a, it's one step or might catapult them into studying about Islam. That's true. But in order to say that, we need some kind of research. I don't have any problem with someone that comes and says, look, we've done research and actually brings, you know, every country will bring six people from the street into Islam. Great. At least now we have research, research to support it. Don't just say, well, once I saw a guy take his jihad because of this and let's all do that. No. Okay. Uh, great. So we're, uh, we're going to move on a little bit, but the whole point, it was an important point, it was let's study, let's see. And a lot of times it's just a guess, and we all go on that guess. Um, there's, I told you, um, there's one popular speaker, and I won't mention his name, very popular, Daya. And he has a rule that in order to give da'wah, you need to be, well, he used to have this rule. In order to give da'wah, you need to be an African American. So please, the, all of you who are from, you know, or Arabs or from the indo pak region, get out. <laughs> you know? So we made up this rule. Okay. We went to, again, this was a Dawah event. We went to D.C. I think I told you the story last month or something. We all went to D.C. give some Dawah. D.C. predominantly African American. So one Arab brother, he made up a rule suddenly. And everybody liked it. He said every, every group, every group of two, has to have a black person in it. Remember the story? So black people became a very hot commodity at that moment. And everybody was trying to grab a black guy, he's my partner. <laughs> so in the end there were two brothers, there were two Arabs, who didn't have a black guy in their group. And they had a thick Arab accent, and they were standing there complaining, we don't have a black guy in our group. We don't have a black guy in our group. What are we going to do here? Yeah, I mean, when the guy said this rule, I just let it go. You know, I said, Listen, just go out and call people to Allah. You know, when we reconvened at the end of the day, each group had, you know, effectively gotten one shahada. Their group got two. The only group that got two. And they didn't have a black guy in their group. <laughs> so, people make up these rules. There's no studies. just gut feeling running on baraka fumes. But that's not how we want to do things, you know. Whatever you do, we want to base it on something. 
And sometimes you might base it on nothing, but it's your experiment. Yeah? And I don't have any proof to say this might work, but I'm going to try it as an experiment. If it doesn't work, I try something else. There's no, I'm not saying don't be creative with that one, right? Be creative, but don't make up these rules. We can experiment and, and, uh, and, and test these rules, but we don't bank on them 100%. Okay, um, so uh, how much time do we have, just so I can place myself? 45? Ah, okay. You, you need a break, maybe? We'll take a break for five minutes? Great. If anyone, no? Just let people go. How about this? If someone feels they need to take a break, you know, to refresh the door, or go to the restroom, or get something to drink, feel free to, to go ahead and do that, okay? So, uh, the do's and don'ts of da'wah, let me see which ones am I going to go over. Maybe we'll go over all of them quite quickly. You have to be patient. So important. They go to, together, that one patience. Because if you're impatient, you might be the reason that someone never ever becomes a Muslim. You could be that reason. You don't want that, ever. And a lot of times people become impatient like that. And they say things that offend people. I remember one time someone, uh, a Hindu, came to the Dawah table. He said, I'm never going to become Muslim. I said, why? He said, I was here yesterday, and some of the people at this table uh, insulted me. And they said, you know, what are these statues and gods and fake gods that you're worshipping? So they insulted him. So he said, I'm never going to become Muslim. Imagine that. We already have enough things to deal with on the Day of Judgment. Now you've got a list of people who said, well, I never became Muslim because he was rude. Or he insulted me. Or he lost his school. So be patient. If you don't want to be the reason, someone never enters into Islam until they go to their grave. So be very patient with people. And you know that my, some people have misconceptions, some people believe what's on TV, some people you know, are, you know, are rude by nature. You will encounter those people. When you're prepared to be patient, to encounter problems, it makes it easier for you. Yes, sir? Um, what if the, the person that you're talking to, um, like they start cursing Muhammad and uh, may Allah, subhanAllah. Like, what, if, what if that's the case? Do you like, like, like is it like, like, do you still have to make patient? Does that happen here? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Sure, huh? Alright. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Uh, what's the, what's the, what can you do within the law here? Because if we're in Sudan, I know what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk it over. What's the problem? <laughs> Will you sign language? So anyways, um, you know the five evidences, right? I always teach my students about the five evidences. Well, if you disagree with me, I've got five evidences for you. <laughs> You're writing them down, mashallah. I'm just joking, you guys. <laughs> Here they are. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Brothers were like, <laughs> I'm going to for being so diligent, though. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, but what can you do within the law? Someone give us a suggestion here. I'm going to be in jail by myself. Somebody else. Yes, sir? What um, uh, he says, Muhammad is this. Yeah, proof. Okay. He's a he's a he's a pedophile. Okay. Where did okay. you hear this? Can you explain? Good. So you know you, you might try to question. Now that might work if that person genuinely believed that and he was telling you that. Now it might not work if the person just wants to insult and get you all riled up. Yes, sir. It's uh, actually from like the human rights, the human resource rights that you are allowed to. Uh, there are some attack, you can attack because it's freedom of speech, but then the speech of hate, they mm -hmm. cross the line. Mm -hmm. You won't be charged for attacking them. Is that right? From what I know, from what I know. Okay. <laughs> All right, you better verify it for tomorrow before we start knocking teeth and stuff. Okay, yes, sir? Uh, I, find, I find patience in the Day of Judgment. Everything that they've said to me will be mm -hmm. accountable to them, but not to me. So. I like you, sir. I wish everyone was like you. That's good. <laughs> you can do that, huh? Yeah. I, right. I find a lot of patience there. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. I just uh, re remember the verses that uh, is that when the arrogant ones come by talking to their mm -hmm. Or when those who insult Allah, you just go walk away from them, right? So just uh, you can you can walk away. You don't have much choice here, you know. So you might be good to walk away if they're just trying to infuriate you. If the brother, like the brother was saying, they really think that's the case, you might. You know, discuss it more with them. Yes. I think usually you have to assume that they don't know better. It's usually something they heard, 
And you tell them, uh, did you read about this, uh, or did you hear this? That's right. I heard this from a friend, a friend of mine or something, or yeah. from the media or something. And you tell them, you know, this is what uh, this Islam, this is Islam, this is Islam. Uh, so good, you can question their source, where they got the information from, so on and so forth. If they're just trying to make you upset, it's probably better to walk away. Especially if you know you have a temper problem, run away. All right, um, all right be clean and, and be neat and clean in appearance. That's just the general recommendation. Like I said, you don't like anything I, I put up there, leave it. It's not an issue. But generally, I recommend that you, if you're purposely going out for da'wah, I recommend you look a little bit above average. Or average is fine. But if you're purposely going out for that, that doesn't mean if I'm walking down the street in my regular jeans and t-shirt, someone asks me about Islam, I have to run to the phone booth, right? <laughs> so my da'wah outfit and I come with my, with my khutra flowing in the back. <laughs> Ask and I shall So, generally, clean. You know, what's the joke with the, on this slide? You want to remember? The nails. Yeah, there you go, good man. So, so the guy, you know, he's got long, dirty nails, and they're all black, dirty, full of crud. And he's telling people, look, in Islam, you have to be very clean. You're <laughs> very clean in Islam. <laughs> Thanks for remembering that. Uh, be straightforward. Allah is very straightforward with this in the Quran. That's how he gets his message across to us. It means, that's the best means of communicating with human beings, being straightforward. Which also means it's the best way they can communicate with each other. That's why the Quran, any question, the answer is this. If you do this, that's the reward. You do that, that's the punishment. It's Arunaka An, they ask you about Qul, that's the answer. It's very straightforward. And it also makes life so easy when people are straightforward with you. And when you're going around in circles and beating about the bushes, they say, you can't really get your point across, and the other person won't understand you either. So be straightforward. Ask for a name. Why ask for a name? New people? Why ask for a name? Yes, sister? Very good. And also, when I'm talking to the person, I have to say his name and his name. Excellent. Jack Al-Khair, sister mentioned two points. Yes? Even the Sosa Sosa did that as well. He was coming from Baif uh -huh. and uh, the, the orchard where he sat down. Uh -huh. uh, the guy who gave him the water, uh -huh. he also asked his name, because, which was Adas. Jack so. Al-Khair, very good. And the Prophet actually, when he asked him his name, he used that to discuss you know, his origin, and then it, it became a da'wah uh, reason. Sister said, ask for the name, it makes a da'wah personal. True? And you want your da'wah to be personal. You don't want to sound like you have a script, and you just come and you spill it out to people. So he makes a da'wah personal. And so the sister also said, you use the name. So, remember the name, and you ask for the name, remember the name, and use the name. If you, if you leave one of these three, it's useless. If you remember it, don't use it. What's the use of remembering it? If you forget it, and every time you come to use it, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Okay, John, John. I'm sorry, what was your name again? John, John, John. <laughs> so, uh, the da'wah becomes personal. Remember how the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Uthman, what did he tell him? He said, verily, I am the Prophet of Allah, sent to you, ilayka wa ila nasi jamia. Can you imagine that? That the Prophet of Allah comes and says, I was sent to you, and then to everybody else, but sent to you. Very personal. So you know when you when you keep using that name in, in da'wah. So so John, we would love that you become our brother of Islam. So John, we actually discussed the most important parts of, of the religion, and you actually right now have the ingredients, John, of becoming a Muslim, John. So you can now, John, become Muslim, John. <laughs> yeah. So use the name, not like that, of course. Uh, number five, find out the beliefs of your prophet. I think I mentioned that before. Number six, smile. And I always tell people you are representing a misrepresented. Religion. You're representing a misrepresented religion. So make it a nice experience. Smile. Now, I don't know, does that work here in Canada? Or maybe you shouldn't smile in Canada? <laughs> but whatever, if it works, tell us. Smile. But I think smiling works universally. I think wherever you are. I don't think there's any culture where if you smile, it means you're upset. So <laughs> smile, and it makes it so much easier. And smiling is contagious, and it shows that you are happy to be there, and it shows that you you know, are confident because people are not confident they don't smile. So it says a lot of things, it conveys a lot of messages. So smile constantly, even when you, they say something rude, you know, you smile, they refuse your pamphlet, smile, they throw it in the trash, smile. One time, you know, we're walking down and there were two brothers in front of us handing out pamphlets, they gave a pamphlet to this guy and he just threw it right in the trash. And then, um, because basically this was, the du'at were coming at him like this, 
He took the pamphlet, and they went by. There was a trash can, he threw it. Then he looked up, and we were coming. So now he felt embarrassed that he just saw me throw the pamphlet. So when we walked by him, I said, second chance. Alas, no, no big deal, you know. But he said, no, thank you. No problem. Doesn't have to work every time. Anyways, um, okay, you know, you, okay, so you're trying to avoid unnecessary arguments, unnecessary confrontations, and that's one of the benefits of having a partner, number eight, because they can help you with issues like that. Sometimes, especially sometimes, you, you might give that out to two friends. One of them is starting to be, you know, is responsive. The other person is, uh, is not. And subhanAllah, you'll find that the one who's not responsive, who's being argumentative, will rub off on the other guy. So here, this is where your partner split them apart. And how do you split people apart? And there are two people standing over here, you're talking to them, and you're standing, and your partner's standing here. And this guy is, is making good headway with this guy, and this guy is not doing a good job of arguing. I want to separate them from each other. How do we do it? You just say, look, you stay with, you go with him over there. You, how do you do it? Well, how would you do it? Um, <laughs> the part that they just ask the other guy a question and kind of slowly move away from uh -huh. the conversation. There you go. Now all I have to do is, as if, so I'm talking to someone over here, my partner's over there. I want to move this guy all the way over there. So, so then I just keep talking to him and I just take a step over like this, you know. So, and then he moves a little bit. After, I mean, a, a little by little I move over and I keep talking to him. And, and then, and he keeps moving with me. And finally, you'll find that we're over here. And the partner's still where they are. Or even if I take two steps this way and my partner takes two steps that way, خلاص, we've separated them. Okay? So it's not it's not that neat. Not everything is just you know, So some of the things just be a little artsy, a little finesse. That's it, makes life easy. Um, uh, okay, here number nine means keep your focus on Tawheed. And this we're coming to this when we discuss, you know, the, the process, the chart, we're not just throwing information. I told you about the guy with the chicken, right? Yeah, the guy who uh, basically gave a talk. I'm talking about Tawheed, and it was a dinner. It was a talk, a speech, and there was a dinner. During the dinner, some Muslim wanted to, he thought it was necessary to introduce this potential revert to the concept of the biha and halal meat. <laughs> so the guy was very intrigued by it. And now after the dinner, I'm trying to talk to him about Tawheed, and he keeps asking me about halal meat. So every time I'm talking about Tawheed, he interrupts me. Okay, well, let me ask you this question. So suppose then, the chicken was killed in the Biha way, but it was not raised in a humane way. Does it still make it halal? And I generally like this topic, I mean, of, of organic, not of halal, not halal. I like the organic and uh, humane and all that. So we're talking, I kept, so I would find myself going into that. Then I stop myself, no, 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 what are you doing? Come back to Tawheed, come back to Tawheed. Well, but if the chicken was, and then I get back to the chicken, then you know what, in the end I just have to tell him, listen, don't worry about the chicken right now, okay? <laughs> right now, I want you to worry about yourself. When you become Muslim, we'll go, and we'll fight for the rights of the chicken, and we'll have signs of the chicken, you know? Free the chicks. You know, just to give you, you know, just so you know how much your society needs you a life. Well, in Toronto, you may have heard this. He told me that they had a table, they had a big sign that said, Free Qur'an. So an old lady came up to him and she said, What did Qur'an do? <laughs> she thought Qur'an was some guy in prison. <laughs> We're fighting for him. Free Qur'an. She said, What did Qur'an do exactly? <laughs> so this is what you're dealing with. Like, we need you. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, yeah, 10, use simple language. That's just basic, you know. Some brothers have a big vocabulary and they always want to show off. They, they think to convince people, come off as a professor. So they use big words like? Elephant and hippopotamus. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Big, long English words. It's impressive. You know, one of the most effective du'a we've ever seen, he has the same speech. He gives it to professors, homeless people. Everybody gets the same speech. This is one of the most effective, not successful, but effective du'a I've ever seen, ever. And he tells everybody about the three questions of the grave. That's his technique. That's it. The three questions of the grave. He's done it. He's said it so many times. He has this incredible rhythm. When he gets started, 
You feel like you're floating. He just he has this very strange rhythm and he just keeps going. Everybody, intellectual, non intellectual, they become Muslim through the same just same basic thing. So you keep it simple, you get everybody. Everybody understands simple. The simple mind and you know the whatever. Whoever is not simple will understand them. But if you keep it at a high level, you miss out. You miss all the simple people. But, uh, you know, we said this before. You look for these things. You try to find what is the issue, what's the obstacle, what's the need. And sometimes it's just ridiculous things. And sometimes it's not. And one time there was someone interested in Islam. They said the only problem is that I don't like the fact that divorce is allowed in Islam. That's it. So then you, help, you, you explain that how, you know, it, it can in some cases even be a mercy. These people will be in, yeah, forced to live their life together when they can't stand each other anymore. Or then, anyway. Uh, so let me give you one example here, just so you get an idea. <clears throat> there was a guy, um, co-worker, and we agreed that he's going to come over to my house over the weekend, and we're going to talk about religion. So we had this agreement, that means I have time, he knows it's about religion, he's not going to escape the topic or anything like that. So we made this agreement, let's say Monday. So Monday during break, later on in the day, he would come to me and say, so we're on for this weekend, right? But you're not going to convert me. Tuesday, he comes in, hey, we're on this weekend, you're not converting me. Wednesday, he's saying the same thing. Now, do we know exactly why he's saying that? Not exactly, right? But we can take guesses. So, who would like to take a guess? Why is he saying that? No, no, new people. Yes, sir? He had what he thought was a, was a killer argument. Oh, okay, so maybe he thought that he's got a, a strong <laughs> argument. Oh, he's going to lay it on me. Yes, sir? Yeah, he's yeah. going to say the same thing. He's got he some strong argument. Argue. What else? Just guessing now. No one's wrong. Yes, sir? He's trying to uh, intimidate you first. He's trying to intimidate me first, right? Yes, sir? He believes the strength that is in refuting whatever you say. He believes, you know, in his, he's very confident that he can refute whatever I say. Uh, he's a like, devout believer. He's a devout believer. His sister in the back? Ego? Ego, yes. He may actually be uh-huh, he could be insecure. Now, are all these possibilities true? Everyone agree? Everyone that was said, everything that was said right now, could have been true, right? And all of these were possible examples. But I, I thought what the last sister said. Now, not, again, I'm not saying, well, I guess well, my, my way is right. But I said, let me test. I think he's insecure. Now, I tested it, and it happened to be the case. I could have tested it, and it could have been what the brother said over here. But I tested it, at least. So what are you going to do? It could be this, it could be that, it could be this, it could be that. But I'm going to test and see which one it is. Make sense? We don't know the unseen here. We test and we diagnose. And so what the sister said, he might be a little insecure. So he's telling himself. He's getting himself pumped up. You're not converting me. You're not converting me. Now for me, that's not a good thing. Why? Why? Ahmed? This is going to come in with an attitude that he's not going to Exactly. He's going to come in with this mindset, I'm not going to be convinced, I don't want to hear it, I'm coming in for a clash, for a headbutt. And I don't want that. So, what, were, what are possible ways, again, there's no wrong answer, what are possible ways you can get him to think, no, it's not like that? What, what, what might you say to them? Yes, sister? Excellent. That's exactly what I told him. You could have tried something else. Yes? Tell him. Okay. Now remember what, what the sister said. I already told you. The problem is that he feels insecure. So, so give me answers related to that. He feels insecure. Ahmed. Uh, can you just explain uh, the two types of uh, hidayah? Okay. Uh, you could. I'm not saying you can't. You could. But it's a bit long-winded. And that suddenly is supposed to make him feel that, oh, so you're only going to guide me and Allah might open my heart. So in the end, I'm still converting him. Yeah? yeah? I would uh, be a really, really rough when he first comes over, and then I talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> you would him feed him really, really, really well. You put a lot of spices in his food, and he's already an American white guy, so he's going to be like this all the time. Yes, yes. Yeah, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? No, I'm not saying you're wrong. Good, okay. Maybe you're that much of a good cook. I mean, everyone will become Muslim. I mean, they taste your food. Ashhadu an. I'm just picking on you. Yes, it's in the back. Sorry? That it's not like a uh, right or wrong argument? Uh-huh, okay, possibly. Well, 
well, if it's insecure, it probably feels threatened by Islam. So you've got to find out what aspect of Islam threatens it. Okay, great, great. Yes, sir? Well, what if you agree with everything I say, then what? Uh huh. Okay, good. Mashallah, you guys are a very intelligent crowd. I say that everywhere I go. And uh, <laughs> I don't, actually. Good, I, I'm loving all the comments and how quickly hands go up. This is great. So, excellent. Everything you said was right. Could have worked either way. The sister said he had a confidence issue, and I figured that's what it was. He, was he doesn't know what I have in store for him when he comes to my house. So he's trying to convince himself and pump himself up that I am going to go as a Catholic and come back as a Catholic. He won't change me. He's afraid that I might drop something on him that's so hard, he'll, he'll come back as a different person than when he came in. So I started to tell him, yes, you're right. I started to give him the confidence. You're right. I can't convert you. Only you can convert you. I can't do anything to you that you don't want. You're the one who have to, who have to accept arguments and, or, not, or reject them if you want to. So I made him feel that we're not coming here to clash, just like some of you were saying. We're just talking. So he actually let his guard down and felt, well, this is good, you know, no pressure. It's not about who will win or lose. It's about the decision I make in the end. Whichever way, I win. And so, alhamdulillah, when he came, he wasn't coming for looking for a clash or a headbutt. Alhamdulillah, he did become Muslim uh, at the end of the talk. So, that's just again, that you find that problem, that issue, that obstacle, you fix it. Yes, sir? Like, uh, how long did you know him before you invited him to your house? Like, what I mean is, like, what did you do before the point you invited him to your house? Uh -huh. In this specific case, I knew him for, um, I don't know, for a number of months. You know, it wasn't a long amount of time. It wasn't like eight months. It was probably in a few months. Uh, we actually became friends very quickly. He's a very nice guy. But uh, I mean, it maybe it would have been maybe it was four months, maybe five. But I'm just telling you this specific case. I'm not saying this is the rule. You should know them this long before you invite them over or something like that. But that's just the answer for the specific case. Okay. Um, but uh, number twelve, you know, a lot of communication is non-verbal, so you listen with your eyes and ears. <coughs> Remember what I told you about the da'iyah? You pay attention to things. You you look at how people say something. You know, what do you understand from this? And I'm giving you actual examples now. Someone says, "Yeah, Islam is such a great religion. If it just wasn't for all that women thing, for the that women issue, what does that tell you? It's a misconception about women in Islam, right? All right, true. Another true story." Someone asked me this question. Now, read into everything that happens before they speak. Pulled me aside and spoke in a low voice. Now look at the words. I just want to check. Is weed halal? <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think is the issue here? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Possibly. Now. And of course, yeah, anyway, we've given the better argument of the doubt. Is it possible the brother has done a little bit of puffing on the side? <laughs> and he's calling me aside, a little ashamed, lowering his voice. His question wasn't, is weed haram? Because if any of you have ever been asked questions by people, most questions are, is this this haram? His question was, is this this halal? And what else, what other non-verbal cues do we see? <laughs> okay. And then when I said, of course it's haram, this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> you see? So, you, that's just a, you know, it's a, yeah, and a whimsical way of saying there are so many ways you can understand what's happening just from the way the question's being asked, the body language, and he's kind of a little bit, you know, you know crying, or uh, what's the word, hunching and, and over and just saying, you know, pulling me to the side, whispering. All that tells you there's some issue going on. So that's what you are as a dad. You look at all these things. Let me tell you the full story of the guy who became Muslim when I gave him the pamphlet. I was walking this way down the sidewalk, and he's walking that way. And as I passed him, I gave him the pamphlet, and I kept walking. When I turned to look at him, he stopped, and he was looking at the pamphlet. Should I go back and talk to him? Why? Because he stopped. Because he stopped. See? You all saw it. You read into a sign. He stopped. Why did he stop? All day I'm giving people pamphlets, they keep walking. Why did he stop? means there's something there. That's a sign for you as a da'ya. So he's interested enough to stop. I told myself, should I go back to him? I said, yes. When I got to him, he said, what do I do now? See? So all you have to do, you have to read into these things. You have to read into these signs. 
So that's what it means. You know, a lot of communication is non-verbal. You look at these things constantly. Try not to overanalyze, but just look at these things. Um, a lot of times with religion, the discussion is in the context or it has the flavor of being an argument. Uh, by the way, something important I have to say that I forgot. As as we're going through, is if you look at the if you look at your notes, the slides towards the end have most of the meat and potatoes in them, the heavy stuff. But as we do these slides, the examples I give you, they're actually you know they have techniques and rules in them. So try to pay attention to them, and I'll point them out whenever I can. So don't say, well, here we're just going over the do's and don'ts. No, in the do's and don'ts, we give you we we, did, we discuss techniques. Did we do that so far? We talk about the technique. You know, this is a technique. Focus on Tawheed, having a partner with you, you know, uh, you know, understanding these issues, how to do it. We spoke about that a couple of times, using the name, using simple language, being straightforward. All this is technique, even though it's just listed under do's and don'ts. So, so while we're going through the stories, pay attention to technique. Um, so we said that most of the time, when you have a religious discussion, it's in, it's in the form of a kind of debate or who will win or who will beat who. True? When that's the case, people usually don't tend to listen to one another. Now, show of hands, who has seen the debate between uh, Jimmy Swaggart and Ahmed Didat, rahimahullah? Great, a lot of people have seen that. Great. Now, who who mopped up the floor with who in that debate? Ahmed Didat and... Ahmed Didat, right? <laughs> and who? Yeah, Ahmed Didat, right? He cleaned up the house, right? Now, what would you say, for the new people, what would you say if I told you there is a church that mass produces that debate without editing and they pass it out to their congregation in church. New people tell me why would they do that? Why on earth would they do that? Yes sir? They're a proselytizing church. They send people out from their church to... But why would they give them that debate where their guy is being destroyed? Yes sir? Apparently <coughs> the Sorry? Okay, very good. Yes? So that they can learn from the debate? <laughs> Possibly, but that wasn't the case. Yes? But actually, he gave the right answer, but go ahead. Do you want to show that Muslims are just debatable people or something? I mean, you could have been right, but that's not why. He already gave the right answer, but your hands are still up. Go ahead. <laughs> I want to give everyone a chance. No? From their point of view, they want. Exactly. That's what the brother said. You, you're just putting in different wording. That's what happened. In their mind, their guy won. Really? Yeah. Yes, can you believe that? <clears throat> How do I get to this point so quick? Usually I discuss it on another slide, but let's just do it here. Their guy won. It's under the dome. Actually. There we go. We just do both now. Don't start attacking, don't start being aggressive. Now, sometimes people read that slide and say, oh, you're saying Ahmadiyya to Allah is aggressive. No, I'm not saying that. Look. They thought their guy won. Why? Because it was a debate. It was a debate context. They only they don't hear the arguments of Ahmad Didat Allah. They hear their guy winning. Because when there's a debate or uh, something aggressive or an argument, people put a mental block and they don't hear what you say. You see? And now, with that being said, I have to clarify. The debate has its place in Islam. But it's not the norm. You understand? There's a place for debate in Islam, but it's not the norm. And a lot of times people think that's the norm, that you start debating. A lot of people take the workshop and then I see them give da'wah. They just try to make the person uncomfortable and paint them into a corner. What about this verse, this chapter, that? Does not contradict what you just said? And this verse in this chapter contradicts both these verses and contradicts you as well. That's not the point. <laughs> Most people will lie, they think that's the case, that they are going to choke and choke and choke the life out of the person before they die, they're going to say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. It's not how it is. What is it? I mean, da'wah comes from tad'u, to invite. So if it's an invitation, it has to be nice and gentle. One more time, let me say it. There's a place for, argue, for, for debates in Islam, but it's not the norm. When you encounter someone, it's not a debate, it's an invitation. So, Think of this da'wah from tad'u, or to invite to Allah. Now, if you invite someone to your house, is it going to be a fight, or is it going to be something nice? And when's the last time somebody grabbed you by the shirt and said, listen, you, 
8 o'clock, my house, biryani. <laughs> Wallahi, if you don't come, has anyone ever invited you like that? Like the one, an invitation. A da'wah is an invitation. So it can't be a fight. And, and so many times, because of people, because of the success of the debate, they think the norm is to debate. And so they spend their time memorizing this verse and that verse so they can tackle it and make you and choke the, the life out of the other person. No. It's a nice and gentle invitation. So, there is a time in Islam for debate, it's not the norm, but the scholars recognize there is a time when you have to debate, but it's not how you go around every day trying to debate. So people become defensive, now let's go back to where we were, we said that because people think of debate context, they don't listen. So how do you get people to listen? Very simple concept, concept of reciprocity, we come to it a lot of times, it's, it's always there in human communication. That to get people to listen to you, all you have to do is show them that you're listening to them. That's it. So to show them that you're listening, this is what you do. As they're talking, you're nodding. Right? Obviously you suspend all activity. And if someone's talking to me and I keep writing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and what if I stop writing and I pay attention to them? And as they're talking, I'm nodding. Yes, I'm following you. You know? Uh, you know using open gestures. Like, you know, if I stand like this, even if I smile, Still looks a little threatening, you know? <laughs> so, use open gestures. Lean forward, you know, and someone's talking to you about religion and you're just like this. <laughs> it's different. What if I lean forward like this and I'm nodding, I'm paying attention? You know, you know, maintain eye contact, but don't stare at them too hard. Don't stare them down. Because it's, you know, it's very hard on people when you stare them down. People become very uncomfortable. Don't stare anyone down. So, what's the solution? They tell you, obviously, if a man talking to a man or a woman talking to a woman, you go between looking at them in the eyes, and then they say, you know, the shirt here, or this button like there, the second button, or over their shoulder. So you go between shoulder, eyes, or button, eyes, and they feel that you're generally looking at them, but you're not staring them down. Um, and so, with, and with women, and, and if a man talking to a woman, or a woman talking to a non-Muslim man, they do understand the concept of lowering the gaze. They do understand that. It's not like they're totally oblivious to that concept. They do, they are aware of it. And uh, sometimes you run into those people who want you to look them in the eye. What are you going to do, right? So you're going to look over their shoulder maybe or something. And maybe every now and then you're going to run into those women that say, hey buddy, up here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so what are you going to do? But for the most part they understand it. And I'm sparing you the stories, but generally there's a, there's a woman. This guy gave her that one for two hours. She wanted to marry this Muslim guy, so he brought invited her to Islam for two hours, he spoke to her, and in a, obviously in a, with people there. When he left, she cried. She said, I've spoken to religious people of every faith, and they all look at me, and they look at my beauty, or they ogle me, they stare at me. She said, this man never, ever once raised his eyes to look at me. She was very moved by that. She knew that he respected her. She didn't study about lowering the gaze and read the ayah. She knew it. So, uh, you know, so so with what, so obviously the opposite sex you would not, you know, stare or you would try to lower your gaze. Um, so the way to get people to listen to you is you listen, show them that you're listening to them, and they will reciprocate because and they will say, no, he was listening to me, I will listen to them. Now I always say that the time some Mormons came to my house, and as I was talking to them, they kept flipping through, the you know, they weren't listening to me, they were just flipping through the Bible preparing their next argument. And I noticed that, and I remember catching it, and I said to myself, oh, you're not listening to me? Huh. Like, we'll, we'll see if I listen to them when it's their turn to speak. When they were speaking, I didn't care what they were I'm just going through my books, preparing my next argument. You think we're going to move forward? Probably not. So, listen. Number 12, listen. And you know what? Most people don't listen. If you pay attention to it, you'll see that I'm speaking the truth. Most people, I'm talking Muslims, non-Muslims, your friends, most people do not listen. Most people are poor, poor listeners. You don't believe me? Don't worry about it. Pay attention to it. Pay attention to it during lunch. You will see that people don't really listen very well. And especially, you know, they don't hear it. Sometimes people ask you a question, they don't listen to your answer. And one of the ways you know people aren't listening to you, when your sentence ends there is a beginning immediately. They weren't, they were just waiting for you to, to shut your mouth, basically. Not paying attention. You pay attention to it, you'll see. Very few people listen. And I also say this, I uh, missed it in a few slides before, very few people smile. I'm talking about Muslims. Very few people smile. 
Pay attention to it, people. Pay attention to it. And talk about good Muslims in the masjid, with the tooth stick, with everything. You don't smile. Don't believe me? Wait till you go to Isha prayer. Notice how many people will smile at you at the masjid. They will say all the nice things to you, but without a smile. But they don't smile. Pay attention to it. Every time you smile, you get a reward. And you know, you see 50 people a day, 20 people a day, 10 people a day, and you smile, you get 10 rewards. Multiply that by 365 days of the year, you have 365 rewards. Multiply that by 50 years of the year, you have. You multiply that if you live up to 50 or 60 or 70 years old, you've got a mountain of good deeds. Prophet said, Do not belittle that shay'a. Do not belittle any of the good deeds. It adds up. And and your smile in the face of your brother is a sadaqah. So pay attention to that. Okay? Pay attention. People don't smile and they don't listen. You'll see. Um, okay. I'm going to skip this because I'm going to come back to it under a different category. Okay? Um, don't make anyone feel dumb. Every question is a good question, right? Uh, and you know, even and they tell you, you know, you've got examples there. Uh, avoid. Uh, so, so sometimes the obstacle is another human being who wants to make problems, noise. Your partner can save the day when it comes to that. I think I always tell the story about the lady in D.C. And basically, I found this guy with a very serene, calm look on his face. So I came to him. Started to give him that well. This old lady came out of her house. She saw us in this white coat. She said, Oh, you're the guys who don't believe in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And she started saying, The Lord taught me how to dance. And she started dancing. So now I don't have time for that, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so my partner immediately knew what to do. See, this is the benefit of having a partner. I didn't have to tell him, I didn't have to do anything. He immediately knew. So he went, he took her aside, they started to discuss dance moves. Well, over here, I could talk to this person without any noise. So that's why the, the partner is just so, such a benefit. And here, I referenced the, the example of the Prophet when he invited his family, including Abu Lahab. And he wanted to give him da'wah, right? And then Abu Lahab stops the Prophet and said, Look, if you're calling us for that new religion of yours, we don't want to hear it. So what happens? According to one narration, Prophet invited them again. Same people, except this time without Abu Lahab. And he called them to Islam. So, avoid him and obstacles as well. Uh, explain, okay, that, okay. That's, uh, I'm skipping that for another section. Uh, this is the golden rule, which is go for the gold, which means make the sale, which means ask for the, ask for the shahada. When do you ask for the shahada? When you've discussed all the essential things and that person has the ingredients to become a Muslim. It doesn't make sense that you don't ask him for the jihada at this point. Right? It's like saying, I'm inviting you to my house. So you're walking all and you're chit-chatting as you're walking to the house. When you get to the door of your house, you open the door, you enter and you slam the door in their face. Same thing. I'm inviting you to Islam. You're talking, talking, talking. When you reach the door, you slam it in their face. No, you ask them for the jihad. And this is the golden rule. I told you there were two rules that I insist upon. Absolutely. This is one of them. I follow this rule so much, sometimes if I'm sure the guy won't become Muslim now, I still ask for the shahad. Because it does a lot to the person mentally. It's saying, look, you need to become Muslim at some point. You know? So, are you ready to become Muslim now? It's really saying you, you actually have to become Muslim. It's just a matter of now or later. But you need to become a Muslim. And uh, I always give the example to sales when they tell you that, you know, in sales, sometimes, and in certain studies, they found, of course, there are many reasons why a sale won't go through. There are a thousand and one reasons why someone will not um, commit to purchasing something, whether it's a suit or a car or you know, whatever it is. There's so many reasons. You know, they, I had a credit card, they only accepted cash. I had to consult my wife, it was the wrong color, it was the wrong size, you know, whatever it is. I can get it at a better price. There are millions of reasons. But, but they found in one area that 96% of the time, the salesman didn't ask for the sale. You have to ask for the sale. You, know? you have to ask for the shahad. Sometimes people don't want to change their life. They don't want to, you know, everything you say made, made, made sense to them. 
that they need that encouragement to ask to become Muslim. And again, you, you, I explained effective versus successful, right? In the beginning, right? So the, I want to show you the, the difference in effectiveness that it made for me, not in success. So I used to stand in front of the store every Saturday, call people to Islam, give them a five minute introduction to Islam. And when I was done, there was this awkward silence because I thought after the introduction, it's such a beautiful religion, they should beg me to let them become Muslim. But they would just stare at me and I would stare back at them. It was very weird, awkward silence. And they were waiting for me and I'm waiting for them. I discovered at this point is when, since we got to that point, the pillars, the Prophet said them, and the Tawheed, now ask for the Shahada, because they have the ingredients of being a Muslim. So the difference between not when I didn't know this rule and when I found out the rule would be like five Shahadas a day versus zero for, for years. That's just effectiveness. I keep stressing effectiveness. I don't want you to think I'm telling you that it's all about numbers. It's not what I'm saying. And a lot of people I know it's all about numbers. Many people come up to me at the end of the workshop, how many shadows do you have, brother? And I always say the same thing. I lost count. I mean, what do they want? Sometimes people, they want you to give them numbers, and thousands. And I can't even, if I wanted to, I couldn't keep up. Yeah, I mean, not to throw that many. I'm just saying, I couldn't keep up like that. Like I was telling you, some people, they'll tell you, you know, brought this many thousand people to Islam. You know, or this many, you know, with the details until this many and 426 people to Islam. And then what? So that means the guy with the highest number is the best da'i. What does it mean, really? So let's not get caught up in the head count, but I'm just showing you how this will make you more effective. So, um, you can't think of one time the Prophet ﷺ went to a group of people to invite them to Islam and then didn't invite them to Islam. Even the sentence doesn't make any sense. So, in order for someone to come into Islam, you ask them to come into Islam. And a lot of times they'll ask reverts in the audience, you know, when did you become Muslim? Well, when finally one of my friends asked me to become Muslim. Um, I can't stress this point enough. I'm not saying if someone asks you, why do you grow your beard, you immediately say, well, um, you know, because I'm Muslim, you want to become Muslim. I'm not saying that if someone has the ingredients of a Muslim, then khalas, you ask them to become Muslim. Now, what if they say no? What if they say no? There's an obstacle. Ask questions and find out the obstacle. When you discover the obstacle, you give solutions. And then what do you do? <laughs> ask for the shahada again, because we'll fix the problem. And if they say no, probably another obstacle. There could be 15, I don't know how many there are. Maybe there are 15, maybe there are two. Ask again, and you know you try to uh, you know, fix that problem. Or if they say yes, you've struck go. Yes, sister. Um, maybe uh, he said no, but there is no reason for no. Uh, you ask it why you are saying no. There is no reason. Yeah, I just don't want to become. And that. So. Mm -hmm. okay, so go. Go. Uh, I think as this point, you can say is my contact information, and you think about it. Because some people can make major decisions at, at a time. They have to think and, uh, and uh -huh. so. They need to think it over, right? But which means the truth is there can never be no reason. Ever. Never. It's just absolutely impossible. You think it's possible? There can be no reason? There's no way. Why don't you become Muslim? There's no reason. Alright, if there's no reason, then become Muslim. Change your mind as, as easily if there's nothing to stop you. It's impossible. They just don't want to tell you the reason. You're a stranger to them. They're not comfortable. They're not ready. They don't want to share. Or they don't believe or like anything that you've said. It doesn't matter. But there's never no reason. Everyone agree with that? I mean, if you disagree, feel free to argue your point. Could there be absolutely no reason? Can't be. But they just don't want to tell it to you. So it's, if you can't get it out of them, what the sister said would be correct. You exchange information, you tell them, well, read, think about it, pray about it, and that's it. What are you going to do again? And you might encounter them again next semester if you're in college, and then you might ask them again. Hey, how you remember we had a conversation last summer or what have you, and uh, did you become Muslim? So, okay. Yes, sister? Can I add uh, something to the this time? Sure, sure. Uh, first, I think that the Raya has to fix his intent of 
put aside mm -hmm. that I am doing this for Allah, not for showing you or so. Mm -hmm. And this is why Allah will give him or me barakah. Uh, the second thing that to make dua for the person I am inviting to Islam. So in my inside, I say, uh, Okay, good. Very nice. Uh, the very good sister saying, have the sincerity, and that's the beginning of part two, we're coming to that. The other part, you're saying you can make du'a for that person. And uh, there, there was one brother, very nice brother, every time I was talking to someone, he would go there and start making du'a for them. Okay, this is a good du'a. You know, I'm down with this as a team up. Uh, make du'a on this du'a. Yeah? Um, with regards to uh, lowering your gaze, when I started, like, lowering my gaze, um, uh, like a lot of like uh, women that I used to uh, talk with, they thought that I was angry with them, and then and that like carried on. Uh huh. Right? Like 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 women would think okay. that they don't like them or something. But so what might you do in this situation? It's quite easy. If they think that you're upset because you're looking down. Like, Thank you. Say it again, Ahmed. Explain Just explain to them why why you're doing it, and it's a good Dawa avenue in and of itself. And, and uh, there are many stories where they're from lowering the gaze people came into Islam. You know, one time we were studying fiqh, one of my students asked me, you know, where should you keep your gaze? I said, in the closet. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. <laughs> I know it's corny, I know, Ahmed. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry? Uh-huh, uh -huh. so you might add a smile. So you might think you're angry, but if you're smiling, it might uh, it might fix things a little bit. Probably. You could just do a lot of uh, like head movements. Like if this is their face, just scan their face like this, and mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us give us a demo? <laughs> Come. I right, well, I do this at work. Okay. <laughs> we can all uh, we can all learn from you. I'll stand here. I want to see how you do that. So, oh, you're shaking hands too. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So, I'm I'm standing at the till and the customer is here. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. so I, I do this at work. Uh -huh. and it's like. Um, how about I stand here so the camera? Okay. Uh -huh. So. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. No, no so, pressure. Uh, so now on this guy, you can get a warranty on it for an extra buck forty nine. He'll uh, he'll uh, cover you for two replacements. Um, it just costs an extra dollar forty nine. Just have to bring it in. Don't need your receipt or anything like that. You want to go with that? Okay. Okay. Just, okay. Did you see that? What do you think? Okay. Just like focus on focus on the area. Even even if you have to like kind of just go over their head. <laughs> <laughs> like you can focus on this area or look like. Look like you're engaged, but well, you don't have a computer. <laughs> but uh, focus on something else while you're doing it, but make it look like you, you're actually engaged. Exactly. You shake hand. Very courageous of you. Very good. Thank you. Exactly. All right. So there are ways around it, and I think we're going to come to more ideas when we discuss what happens when someone's trying to shake your hand. How do I do it? There's so many ways, like the, what the brother did just now, that they won't really pay attention. That that you actually didn't look at them. We're going to discuss some techniques that they won't really, dis dis I mean, they won't really notice that you didn't shake hands with them because you made it so smooth. So, Jakalaka, thank you very much for coming up here. I think it's probably time to stop, isn't it? Okay. But lunch time, Jakalaka khairan. When we come back, we'll continue, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.